Welcome to the API Resilience Podcast. If you've ever wondered what it really is we do when we do APIs, and if you've wondered how APIs change organizations, our communities, and our society, look no further. This is the podcast you've been searching for. I'm Christophe van Tomme, and together with my co-host Mark Bergauer and our guests, we explore how deliberate complexity, social practice theory, and a deeper understanding of social technical systems can transform our organizations and the world we live in. So welcome to the API Resilience Podcast. Uh, today we have Don Ahokana, who is a computational designer. Uh, computational designers, if you don't know what that means, or if you can't imagine it, uh, are creative people that apply their mastery and knowledge of how people, software, hardware, data, network, and systems all interact as one system. Uh, she works as a design leader in IBM Systems Business Unit, and she helps clients in partnership with business partners to simplify IT management and operations using preventive maintenance analytics and insights. So uh, Don has been a guest previously on uh, the Deliberate Complexity conference series, and she had a lot of really interesting things to say about um, APIs and, and how that all works together. And just looking at this introduction and, and her job description, uh, this is gonna be an amazing conversation. I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you Welcome for down. having me. <laughs> thank you for having me. And thank you very much for taking the 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 job description for the conference so serious and and really like thinking about this whole you know APIs as as um, as membrane interface like really thinking about that and and um, yeah you, we were talking about it with Mark that you were one of the speakers who who really thought it through and who really brought the presentation that was up to the conference. Well, well, yeah. I. I I grapple with this all the time, mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, one of the reasons why I do I have the role that I have is is standing at that intersection, and and sometimes I feel like I'm standing as stride and strong, and sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like I'm almost doing the splits just to try <laughs> and keep one foot in each um, each area. And I thought it was a really interesting topic because APIs are a conversation that I have with designers, with product managers, with executives, and depending on who I'm talking to, they're talking about either using them, uh, making them go away, because they're a problem, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> updating them, refining them. How do I manage uh, and make a business out of this API and then mm -hmm. keep three versions and get all my customers updated from API version one to three when the customers on one are very happy and it's doing what they need it to do. So wh where, do you, where do you do the point of abstraction? Do you fake? and strangle version one, move it to three, but everybody still thinks that they're on version one? Mm -hmm. Or do you keep the two and keep all the complexity on the internal? Or do you just make it go away and sell something else? So um, what I wanted to do, and I get accused of being theoretical and in my head a lot, was making sure we talked about the theory and then proposed and shared an empirical example of how I apply what I'm thinking about, because I think it's important to make things tangible. And, and, and as a designer, and also as a storyteller, I think that when you're talking about something that is like headache inducingly complex, making people laugh, keeping things light, and having a conversation helps you kind of get through, through that. So, I, I guess it's a gift that I have that um, I'm always finding connections and analogies um, and juxtapositions with things. So I brought all of that, uh, and it was an interesting. It was an interesting topic. It's not something I always get to talk about. So I really appreciate you guys giving me the space to to run with it. What I thought was really interesting was this. Uh, it was almost like layering additional information or additional constraints on top of the information yeah. and um, and how that uh, makes the 
uh, API or the information that is flowing through the API accessible for additional people. And uh, it, it's something that, um, so I've been talking to customers about uh, like APIs as, oh, well, we, we, we do developer portals. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I normally talk about developer portals as interfaces for the interfaces. And that, that's not just APIs, that is also other interfaces. And, um, and this uh, also spectrum, we were talking earlier about spectrums before, before start recording, that it's not, um, there's this interface spectrum of uh, very abstract, which are APIs, all the way through full applications but it's it's a spectrum. It's not either apps or APIs. There's exactly. like a whole bunch of stuff in between. Exactly. And, yeah. and and it's because those things have value. Mm -hmm. If someone's going to put their hand in their pocket and give me money, then part of my response is like, okay, how much you want to give me? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll go and figure out how to make that thing and and get it uh, get get that thing is enough either of a pain. Or is, is is enough of a desire for someone to say, I I will <clears throat> part with this amount if you can get me X. Mm -hmm. The gauntlet has been thrown down. That's the challenge. How do you figure out how to make X? And, and like you said, uh, Christoph, is everything from the physical uh, hardware box where that thing is running all the way to the device that's in their pocket and they don't even care where the server is. I just want this thing to happen, right? Yes. That, that's the spectrum we're talking about. And, and it's literally running up and down that ladder and figuring out how you make levels of abstraction that are useful, desirable, and valuable. Yeah. And, and then also, how do, you, um, how do you sell that to your management? Because there's- If somebody, again, yeah. slams 1 million, 2 million, 5 million <laughs> on the table, then usually they're like, go and build no, that. No, well, that's okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so what we often encounter is that people say like, oh yeah, we're going to do APIs. And, and, and that's it. It's like, it's its own category. It's its own thing. Yeah. And we're doing APIs now. I did a webinar just now and somebody asked, yeah, but we, we, we want to do API first in, in our organization. And I was like, yeah, but be very careful because you're you're just look like too many organizations stare themselves blind on this strategy. Like we're going to do APIs instead of what is the interface that we need for this job, and uh, and how are people going to interact with it, and how are we going to right? And but I don't know. Have you seen maybe in your work? Have you seen a way to um, communicate the spectrum rather than the slices? Well, one of the lessons <clears throat> that I've learned, um, and I, 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 just to remind everybody, I was a research scientist, developer, and technical architect for a very long time. And right now, I design experiences. Mm -hmm. So I'm closer to the human than I am to the technology. And that's because all the variation is in the 9 billion different humans that we have and we have to cater for. And that's also where the, the fun and the challenge is. So starting with the premise, we're going to be API first, tells me that somebody, and I'm not joking when I say this, somebody put a check in front of you and said, build okay. this <laughs> and, and, and I will pay you. Now, if someone didn't do that, then you have to look at the whole spectrum. And this is something I know as much as people um, either venerate or denigrate Apple, mm -hmm. this is what they've done. They've never been first at anything, but when they come in, they, they, don't do, they don't do, we'll just take the slice. They take the entire house, kitchen sink, everything, mm -hmm. and, and, and give you a whole solution I'm not crazy about how everything is prepackaged and you can't repair and all of that. And that's a conversation for a different time. But they've really focused on the experience that you take something of theirs and it just works. Mm -hmm. I am I'm talking to you guys, we're all geeks here. Protocols, 
uh, video codecs, all of that stuff. I was up to my elbows in when I was using Windows mm -hmm. and uh, Linux. I have no idea. I have a complete consumer experience most of the time, unless I'm developing on my Mac. I have no idea how the thing even runs or functions. And you know what? I really don't care. I open it, I turn it on, I type, it works. That is the level of interaction and interface that I care about at that point. Sometimes I do want to go deeper, but not all the time. And the analogy I give to my colleagues is the difference between if you wanted to play a song, right? If you want to play music, you have three controls, minimum, on, <laughs> off, so, so sorry, uh, turn the thing on, start and stop. <clears throat> what my colleagues and I do is that we give you a 50 lever, 100 <laughs> knob <laughs> mixing desk <laughs> and tell you to, Mix yourself out and mix anything you want. I don't want to mix. I just want to play that song at a particular volume and enjoy myself and have an experience. I do not want to mix it. I don't want to do post-production. I don't want to do any of those things. And, and so when, when I talk about the spectrum of the API, Christoph, that is the analogy that I usually use. I literally pull up a mixing desk and most people are like, what is that? Why are you showing me that? I said, that is what you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. that you can to build and give to someone, this is what they want. So you do need the mix, the mixing desk. Yes, absolutely sits underneath all of those three controls, but did they ask for the mixing desk or did they ask for the on button or play button to play the music? Or a specific configuration of the mixing desk. Right. All... right. Or right. we want to listen to voice. Can you just give us the right configuration for voice? Exactly. We want to listen to orchestral music. I, so... I'm using Mac since 84. And one of the core arguments where I always said I'm using Max is like, I don't have time to configure. So as you said, Apple always actually thought, what are people actually going to do with this thing? But what a lot of people forget that in 84, so at the very beginning of the journey of the Mac, one of the core things that they already had in mind was what, what is the developer experience more than anybody else. So at the time, I, I when I picked up a Mac, I was able <clears throat> You know, to program a pet Commodore. I was able to program in DBase on a, a CP, what's it called? CPM. Yeah. Um, the DOS, etc. So I knew yeah. all these worlds and how to live. <laughs> and when the Mac came along and you got an initial Pascal interface, it's like, hey, I could build applications in no time compared to any of the other. Ex so developer experience was at their forefront. I think that's why Swift came along, is they remembered developer experience matters and we lost that edge and they tried to reintroduce it well but and this is the point to your point mark that i make developers are people people yeah. sometimes talk about developers as if they're this special robot that <laughs> sits in the corner and just pop that code they're people i agree with you and so to your point and to your question um christoph my first analogy of this talk is Mixing desk versus three buttons. Which one? And and the people that I'm talking to don't even know that what I'm showing, they're already upset with me. What the hell is that? That's the mixing desk that you were suggesting you want to give to people, and you don't even know what it is. How are you going to make sure that that's the right thing for your your audience? But what are the what are the slices? Because it feels that there's slices of abstraction that are that there's certain useful slices of abstraction in there so i think that a lesson and a place to look is if you look at consumer electronics <clears throat> let's say cameras for example now i have to confess i was one of those people who said that who the hell was ever going to use a camera on this device? <laughs> and I'm holding a mobile, a smartphone. So I have to, I have to admit, I didn't have the foresight to see the potential um, for that. But you've got everything from even before we had smartphone cameras, you had point and shoot, Insta cameras, uh, Polaroids where you could get your thing straight away. You had 
uh, a variation where you had some level of control that you're comfortable with all the way through to SLRs to professional where you had every knob under the sun. The upper limit, I remember talking to uh, a guy who worked for Nikon, the upper limit was the dexterity and how many fingers that you had. If you put more that couldn't be held or controlled or in a particular configuration, and they spent time and studied this, they worked that they worked that out. So to your question about what are the abstractions, what's the environment? What are the factors? Is it the fact that you can only have ten fingers looking at you know holding that thing? Is it <clears throat> how heavy it is and what physically people can carry. Um, is it the environment that it's going to operate in? So you have to look at, and I'm going to be a designer here, we always say, step back and look at the wider environment. What, what, what system does that abstraction belong to? And what's its function and how is it going to operate? That gives you a good idea, and then you still have to iterate through and eliminate um, all the variations that nobody wants mm -hmm. <laughs> to hit the one or two or three that are the money shot. My second thing, and people have heard me talking about this, uh, Jabe Bloom, who I know has been on your podcast, talks about having either a really powerful magnet mm -hmm to attract and extract the needle that's in the haystack or you go haystack diving, which means you're going to spend a lot of time looking at straw before you find the needle that you were, you were looking for. And some people settle for a very strong piece of straw or say, okay, that's the needle. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so the answer is it depends, but I think, um, uh, there is a, an operating theory. If you if you start with the end in mind and work backwards, it's ten times faster than just trying to eliminate um, yeah. all your possibilities. But it's it's like well, one thing that I've seen. Um, I, I I don't know if it it applies to your context because I I suspect that you're very much in a B two B context, like where you're or. But most, most, most of, of the, the time, most yeah. of the time, most of the time, uh, we, we've got some customers that are um, uh, providing tools for building digital experiences um, also to SMEs. So there's the, the, the enterprise customers and they've got money for custom integrations for diving the haystack. But then they have a bunch of SMEs and they don't have money for developers. They just. No. They just want they just want a needle. <laughs> so they they do, but they're very clear and specific about how, where, what they want, what is the value. So if anything, it's more important to talk to them to figure out what configuration of their ten fingers mm -hmm. is the thing that they're going to spend money on. Otherwise, the problem, the the, the challenge always with um, the space that I work in, which, like you said, is business to business is uh, from a retail aspect, I call it uh, stack it high, sell it cheap. There's enough that if you sell enough of it, there's enough demand, you sell enough of it, you make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But it's a very narrow um, area. If you're looking at small businesses, the variety is huge and no one solution is going to address all of them. Mm -hmm. So you have to be satisfied with the long tail business. There might be one or two things, yes, they're gonna make you a lot of money, but where you're going to actually make most of your money is <clears throat> the variation and, and being able to be flexible enough to, to um, variable enough that most people will use it. And what Apple has been able to do is hit both of those regions. Mm -hmm. You do not have uh, 3 billion, 4 billion people using a device without figuring out how to accommodate all of that variation. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that, uh, because I, I think that this is the, so the API landscape as, as like the, the interface layer, it feels that it needs to go a little bit less abstract for really becoming mainstream. Uh, well, I, I think that 
um, the, the, the thing that APIs, where they add value is, there's always a level of um, exploration and discovery. Uh -huh. And you need handholding and user interfaces or whatever interfaces for that. Once you've figured out what your flow or your system or whether it's done and you just want the thing automated or you, you know, you just want to, to automate it and forget it. That is the beauty of APIs. Mm -hmm. Because then I don't want to sit and press a button 12 times mm -hmm. when I could just send something off and it would do it 12 times and it would be confirmed and done. So guess where the, the automation is the long tail, but everybody's focused on, oh, the first experience, the, you know, mm -hmm. it's like the, in cinema, they get ratings um, on the first week or two weeks that mm -hmm. they're in the cinema. I've always thought that that's crazy because people don't only watch a movie in the mm -hmm. first two weeks, they watch it all the year round and you're still making your money. Um, but again, it's really respecting, uh, back to the conversation we had about time, opening your, your, your aperture for time where your definition of success isn't the first two weeks that something comes out. Mm -hmm. The definition of success is the first year, the first two years, the first three years, because it might take that long to reach the level of people to make the sort of money that you would want to make in order to be successful. But on the flip side, you need to keep the lights on long enough to be around for year one, year two, year three. So there's, there's always a, there's always a tension, um, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I think that, that looking for instant or easy solutions uh, is, is long gone. Tech is not the challenge, it's people. Mm -hmm. And they're not predictable mm -hmm. <laughs> or programmable <laughs> or, or, or any of those things. So there's an interesting challenge that I experience a lot in opening the aperture for time. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just going to give an example of how I experience that um, very often. So a while back, I worked with a team that was building mobile apps for a company. Yeah. And... Uh, so all that measuring was always like, so when they want to try to assess a new feature, they were always measuring, so how does it do the first two, three weeks that we, so that's what everybody had their eyeballs on it. And I then so came along and just asked a silly question and said, so do you have any data about usage of your features that are old? Like how many of the features that are in your app um, are you measuring? And, and I don't know, we, we actually usually lose interest after two, three weeks. So they started measuring this and started realizing, hey, uh, two thirds of the features are hardly ever used. Yeah, so we're carrying these around, but we're constantly praising these as big successes because in the first two, three weeks they were used. Yeah, and that's often how I experience when I use the phone app or so, oh, there's a new feature, oh, yeah, I'll try it. And I realize, yeah, I don't really need it and I stop using it. <laughs> so there's, this goes hand in hand with the second problem that we're all the time experiencing in IT. We try to address it with DevOps, and even though that we're making inroads, it doesn't go away. Is that actually the cost of operating software always outstrips um, the cost of developing by by a long shot? So when you go into especially digital transformations, yeah, everybody's focusing like, how do we make development faster? Yeah, nobody looks at the ops guys. And so you have this faster and faster uh, release of new features and blah, 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 which somebody has to operate. Somebody has to keep the servers up, uh, whether they're cloud or real or whatever. You have to make sure the capacity to actually operate this stuff is still there. Um, but in in manage, so when I then talk to managers and I try to explain these two problems to them, there are some that get it, but they will usually be coming to me and say, yeah, but I'm not measured on that, yeah? I have this list roadmap given by my boss, yeah? And I need to do all of these things. And whether I do them well or not is like the month, the, the monthly meeting after the release is when I show them the stats, yeah? And those stats have to look good. And if they look good, 
bingo. Yeah, we all get promotion and we're seen as the great team, etc. And if the stats don't look good, then that's failure. Yeah. And what happens three months later? Nobody cares. Yeah. So what you're saying when you say we have to keep the we have to opening up the aperture of time is we have to actually start to to see what we're building with APIs, et cetera, is, is impacting the ecosphere in which we're operating, so the environment, et cetera. But what we experience in the organization is there's a lot of drivers that actually constantly try to close this aperture. So how, how do you manage, how do you get that people to accept that or to start to see the benefit of that? I, I have a, I have two, two, um, I'm giving all my secrets away here. I have two. That's why we bring people on the podcast. <laughs> uh, I have two two strategies um, approaches when I observe what you just said, Mark. Where um, first of all, uh, some research in order to validate the human aspect of it and what's the value. Without that, and I really don't have a leg to stand on, and it's my opinion versus somebody else's. And then the one that you guys are all familiar with is the internet is wrong. You put out a provocation that is just so wrong <laughs> that people are like, no, stop, hell no, it's this. But what happens then is because that is coming from almost an uninhibited place you get the real motivation if if it is actually that um people have decided that their motivation is going to be that they have to hit this target in order to get some specific goal that is just the reality of that situation so i either have to uh, comply with that go over, under, around, or through if that is not what I align with or I say I'm not doing it. That you don't always have the option to do that. So the one is the provocation. The second one, and this is one of the reasons why people always ask me, why are you a designer and a technologist? I don't have to beg anyone to make a vision that I see. I can do that myself. So you're there talking about short term, this is what's going to happen. And I can put in front of the same audience that we're trying to convince or make a decision, information that says, if you make this thing, wait three months or six months, and you make something like this, touch it, play with it, feel it, experience it. Then which one is better? A, one, for you as an individual in terms of the experience, and two, as a company. Where are we going to make more money? Yes, you have the measure, but nobody, like you said, Mark, is using it after two weeks. <laughs> or if you make this thing, uh, and I'm putting my neck on the block here, and so people have to be able to, to feel and touch, and it's one of the reasons why I've always kept... Um, involved in technology is to a be able to to speak the language but also if i have to create the experience and show what it's going to look like rather than talk about it so those are my two um approaches to that challenge because people can't can't do what they can't see once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. And if they still make the decision that, yes, it's a short-term thing, then there's obviously there's a whole bunch of things that are going on that are not necessarily in my control. And I need to spend the fine time, if I can, figuring out what that is. It's not the technology that's the problem. It's not the market. It's something else that's going on. I think there's, so one thing is like the, the relationship between the features and the product. But then there's also the, between the product and the product suite, and like in, especially in in, a, in the API landscape. Yes. Uh, this happens a lot. That it's just, um, well, this API first strategy comes to this result. I, I, well, I don't know if this this is happening in 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 your context, but it's just everybody should be building stuff, and then we just publish it, and there's a whole bunch of stuff, and. 
and it's so the same the same dynamic that we just talked about where we're just adding features and then there's some features that nobody's using anymore the same thing is also happening with the the interfaces that we're producing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and there's there's no overview of what are we actually trying to do here with this whole program well there's a conversation <laughs> On, uh, that's what I'm saying, Christoph. You must have been eavesdropping on my uh, conversation. <laughs> I, I was talking to um, a general manager uh, Monday or Tuesday of this week, <clears throat> and one of the very things we were talking about is um, the thing with the suite. Everybody always thinks about Office as mm -hmm. a, as an example because you can relate. And then I mentioned and I said, by the way, it's not just creating the suite once. You have to keep doing it because there is there is a a drift, an expectation drift. There's actually a theory by uh it's called the Kano model. Mm -hmm. And the the ironic thing is that a lot of UX models and patterns have been developed by economists. I don't know what the the, mm -hmm. the correlation is there. So Kano, Japanese economist, and he focused on customer satisfaction and quality. He has the traditional four by four, but his four by four is three dimensional. Uh -huh. It's not just one dimension. So on the horizontal, you have, um, I'm trying to remember now. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's quality on the X and then on the Y, it's um, satisfaction. So obviously you want to be in the top right quadrant, but there's a kicker. The first uh, left quadrant where you have high, high uh, satisfaction and low quality is actually called uh, excitement generators or as everybody calls it, low hanging fruit. You create a lot of excitement. Your two weeks mark that you were talking about. A lot of excitement. Yay, I'm going to go check it out. And then, oh, is that it? Um, and the benefit with that part of the quadrant is that it doesn't, it doesn't require a lot of investment to get a lot of interest and therefore make a lot of short-term money. Mm -hmm. But it's not sustainable. Then you have performance um enhancements which is linear you invest you get the the the, the payout you, you know people keep finding quality and it keeps going up and then the last one is basic expectations people don't tell you that they want those things but they will sack you if you don't have them so you can only do a bad job there and the kicker is that those excitement generators become performance enhancements and then become basic expectations they're expected so that's what happens over time. That means you have to keep adding to your excitement generators and degrading them to performance enhancers and then making those performance enhancers basic and either improving them or cutting them off. So that, that is a model that I talk to a lot of my designers, uh, product managers, business people about that it's not a one and done. It's a whole ecosystem, network, pipeline, all these things are connected and you have to keep iterating and doing it. And we were talking about the suite. So the problem with the suite is the suite is those three things from the Kano model. So what in the suite is an excitement generator, almost like a, you know, get, get your foot traffic in like a mall. What are the things that make you your main money and what are the things that you need to be cutting off to Mark's point some of those things, they got to go, you know, the X stock out, they need to go out. They're no longer useful. And, and if you, if you, once you have an ecosystem, which is what an, a suite is, you have to design it and you have to create it in that way. Otherwise you will learn, you know, the market will teach you lessons the hard way. I see different aspects of it. I think on the outsides, when, when companies are providing external facing interfaces that i think there's more understanding there about this this cleaning stuff up and but on the inside it's a mess it's an absolute mess yeah because it's invisible it's not seen so unless uh, another thing we were talking about um uh, mark was how things happen but because of the limitations of our senses 
we only know that it's happened after the fact because we can see the impact. Mm -hmm. And APIs to some extent are like that because you don't see them whilst they're operating. You only see after the fact that it's a mess because uh, there's a bottleneck. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden the whole system collapses because there's so much load or there's so many demands that it, it can't. But this built up over time. Who, who was watching that? Nobody. Um, so, so the thing, the, the, and that's why uh, one of the things that I say is when you make an abstraction, what is the value? Who is paying for it? Because somebody has to pay for it to be made. Somebody has to be able to maintain it. Somebody has to create it. If those things are not taken care of, then why do you even have um, that abstraction? Back to your point about, yeah, we're gonna be API first. Where's the value in that to your target audience? If your target audience is never gonna use that API, understand it, be familiar with it. Um, another example I said was the codex. I only learned them because I had to. I wasn't interested in H62.4 or whatever it, the latest ones were, but I couldn't achieve what I wanted to do without doing that. Um, was it of value to me? No. Mm -hmm. hmm. So another aspect, so if you say it's internal messes is also, so how do we incur debt? Whether it's technical debt or organizational debt, so is so things are drifting. Yes, yeah, so I'm going here with Jay Bloom's. I'm not sure he he, he would say he, it's all his ideas, but he has a nice articulation where right. he essentially says so the core the core reason we're we're experiencing deficits. Yeah, to oh here's how we would like the state to be. Here's the real state of things. <laughs> yeah. uh, not so nice. In, because things aren't static. So never mind about, we take shortcuts here and there, but we're aware of them. But the real problem is actually the things drift. Yeah, so um, your environment changes. So hence, even if you develop something for a past state of the environment perfectly, now you have a deficit. Um, but a lot of this is, is also due to organizational attention. Yeah, so how much attention can we spend on keeping things orderly, et cetera. So then if we look at about people who try to show benefit for money spent, yeah, so you go a bit further up on the chain, maintenance never never comes up in those equations. Um, the cost of maintenance, et cetera, um, they, might, they might become interesting at some point when the cost cutter comes around and somebody says, oh, well, why are we spending this amount on maintenance of this and that? But usually by that time, it's already a bit late um, in terms of you know making things tidy again. But we're already in the big ball of mud um, dimension, whether, whether it's technical or organizationally. So you can explain a lot of this with Conway's law, but as as recent conversations have been going also uh, on Twitter, etc., is we actually start to see okay, so the communication structure also actually just an outcome of other things like, for example, budgeting. And so it's very interesting that you keep pointing out who's paying for this and what do they want to get for it. And so James Three Economies plays that we discussed. Right. Oh, right. Is exactly the point he makes. It says four things like an API which is different than from looking after infrastructure and is different than from actually being focused on user value, you have a different economy, yeah? And unless right. you can actually talk about this in an economic sense differently, you will you will end up with a mess. So the way out is actually to say, so, okay, so how are we, it's not just who's spending it and what do they want for it, but also how are we spending the money? And most organizations, um, still live in the bimodal world. So they say, even though we're applying product thinking, yes, yeah, so what product people want to do, or we, we, we're we operating in the uh, old IT operational world where we say, oh, we have to constrain resources because they're finite and we, we don't want to overload our systems. Whereas actually API is a different economy. It's, so as he says, things gain with value. So the API gains in value the more it's used, yeah. 
It becomes more valuable to the organization, it becomes more organization, uh, valuable to the people who benefit from it at the user end, the more it's used, which is a different economy from the other two. Yeah, so this lines up, uh, what you've triggered in my mind, uh, Mark, is uh, literally what bumped into my head was the Wardley map, right? Genesis, I never remember the second one, product, what is it? Um, custom, custom built. Yes, uh, product and then commodity, right? Mm -hmm. As you move towards the commodity, commodity is where APIs live. That That is predominantly where they should live because that is fully automated, contained, packaged, set, forget, forgotten. Product um, still needs a level of, uh, that's the mixing desk, if you like, to some extent. The three buttons is at the end. The custom built, that is your audio file with his um, uh, copper wires and <laughs> tuned speaker and all the rest of it. And then Genesis, your inventor. So you think about those, and that lines up with your, with, with what we're talking about with uh, value and economies. So um, saying you're going to go API first when you're, you've just observed something and trying to prove and make it true is like totally wrong headed. You haven't proven the case, you haven't proven the value, you haven't even got people enough, enough people signed up to say, yes, I would, I would use that. So whenever I hear someone say, yeah, we're gonna go API first. The first thing, I hadn't thought about it that way until you said what you said about Jabe's three economies. Um, but the first thing I'm looking for is, what are you commodifying? If you're not commodifying, then, because there you're talking about scale as well. So there's enough that you don't want an individual to keep repeating. I said, made the example of the 12 buttons. If I don't even have to press a button at all, I would prefer it. I don't want to even have to think about that because it's not, that's not valuable uh, to me in terms of my time or what I want to do. Um, but, uh, the problem sometimes that I get is I'm having the same conversation I'm having with you, but people are like, yeah, but show it to me. Can, are you saying you can't do it? No, I'm saying it's the wrong thing in the first place, but you then have to have the alternative. Otherwise it looks like you, you don't know how to do it. You're just, you know, saying that they have a silly idea because it's ego or whatever. Um, so you do have to have, Again, like I said, step back, bigger picture. What is your API providing and what system is it going to operate in? Is it, is it genius, uh, <laughs> custom product, or commodity? Okay, I have, I have a little advantage in most engagements that I'm working. I'm coming in under the guise of Agile. So I don't need right. to, I, I often don't need to have to have exactly that conversation. I can mitigate by then just to saying, well, what do you need most? What do you need first? Okay, yeah, well, the other things, they'll, we, we know you want them, but so ruthless prioritization often actually sharpens the mind. You don't force them to make a yes or no choice. You just make a now or later choice, which they often find a lot easier. So if, if you say, yeah, I know you want this all singing, all dancing, mixing decks, but what do you need tomorrow? They will say three buttons, please. Correct, yeah? correct. So um, uh, again, you made me think of something where uh, when I was a consultant, a lot of the times so I was going into clients and um, we had this standing joke. Uh, did you give them opiates, ibuprofen, or <laughs> and usually <laughs> pain relief? They are in such a dire situation that the first thing that they need is just to, to literally, you know, stop the pain. Because also, if somebody's in pain, you cannot have a logical conversation. They're not thinking about anything else other than they need the pain to stop. Once the, you've got that relief, almost in the euphoria of the relief, then you have that conversation about the, the wider thing. Because they're, they're literally like, uh, yeah, 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 whatever. I'm, I'm so happy that I no longer have, um, have the pain relief. You, I'll give you a blank check. And then you almost have that uh, that cycle. So uh, again, as a consultant, I would go for the 
gnarliest, horriblest, painful problem because off the back of that, then usually you could then have that because one, you've built credibility, two, you've taken, you've actually given them relief and value. And people are, when the opposite of, of that kind of pain is euphoria. People are euphoric. They're usually a lot more conducive to having um, uh, those kind of conversations. But there's also my experience. So the, the people in organizations as a consultant, as somebody coming outside and help, that have the gnarliest problems are also the most neglected one. So you're actually going to have on a people level, actually usually the best time with them. Yes, their problems are horrendous, but they've been neglected. So somebody coming and say, yeah, tell me, uh, talk to me about your problem. They can finally articulate and somebody's listening, etc. And so then you give them a bit of pain relief. You already have a good relationship. Then that's, that's partially also um, why good things happen. I, I have advocated this for years now that I, I said, if you try to do ch change in an organization, yeah, there's two mistakes that people always make, yeah? So the first one is give me all your best people. So the problem with best people is they're best in the current environment. They have absolutely no interest to really change the ecosystem because they know how to be successful currently and they, they're resistant to say, hey, why should I change that and then have to learn how to be successful again? But then the other thing is also they go for low hanging fruit. Yeah, say, okay, how can we prove the point most quickly? And you absolutely learn. So, especially if you use both approaches, you'll learn absolutely nothing. What you actually see is that whatever transition model you're using, they're going to use all the labels and all the illustrations, but they're going to do things the way they always have done. Absolutely, things. because that, that works for them. But also, um, so I usually say, so where does it hurt the most? Yeah who has nobody talked to etc you go work with them first of all you're going to learn all the problem all all the dysfunctions in the organization are have artifacts on display yeah so as you tackle them you can literally actually show the rest of the organization how you undo some of these dysfunctions um but as i said also um the not best people are often not the best people because they're working in areas where it's really hard. That doesn't mean they're less smart than the best people or less ambitious. Any of these things, it's just usually they work in an area that people don't pay attention to. Yeah. And because they're not paying attention to, it's hard. Mm. So transition should be really like bottom up, which also goes very well with complexity theory. Mm. So find really who who keeps the lights on is is always one of my good questions no no not not who is your glamour blah blah blah. who keeps the lights on who are the people who come in when things go really badly um but then also yeah don't try to do something quickly try to undo something that's really hard and and gnarly as you say so you you are you are in the basic expectations quadrant right there that's and where you learn the most yeah yep yeah. And, and I think I think that um, as well, you made a point and said uh, the, the change, the effective change should be made bottom up, one step at a time. That's what it takes. It's like changing any habit. You just have to keep doing yep. what you need to do. But you also have to create the environment for that. And that's why it's always important to have the... Uh, management, executive, whatever, sponsorship, because that gives you the runway. If you don't have that, then you're literally flying off a cliff with Agent. no safety net. So it's always, uh, I think, a balance. And uh, the people who I've seen do it well have created the environment for fostering that change, given permission and then got the people ready to take advantage of it. And those two things have to have to line up and they don't always. Uh, again, is getting the time aperture right for that interaction. You can't have everybody for a year go through change management training and not do any change. <laughs> At the end of that year, everybody is trained and has forgotten it, and there, there's, there's been no, no impact at all, no value for, for that investment. So, it's working out how to do that 
almost in an iterative cycle. Yeah. Talking about consulting and and like approaches in how to help people see the light. One one of one of the questions that we've been asking, uh, I think all of our our guests, but not sure. Uh, I think or almost all of our guests is, um, do you talk about complexity to the people that you know to your management and to your colleagues? Uh, or, well, first, do you talk about complexity directly, or is that a difficult thing? And and if it's a difficult thing, have you found a way to communicate about complexity that makes it easier to get people around to thinking in a more complex, aware uh, way about the world? So rule number one, don't talk about something. Mm -hmm. The fastest way to get an executive to tell you, get out my office, <laughs> is talk about, <laughs> talk about something uh, and define it. Mm -hmm. They've probably seen it already and they're trying to figure out how to, to, to fix it. Um, uh, designers have a saying, show, don't tell. This is where I would uh, prototype something, which would either be such a bad job provocation, people like, look, sit down, let me tell you how this should be done, <laughs> and I will show you, so you get that. Or it starts a conversation. Oh, I'd never thought of that particular angle. Well, if you do that, then what? And then what? And then what? And and it is complexity, but it's it's it has to be pragmatic at that point. Then after the fact, and most people never remember what it's called anyway, I might come back and say, oh, oh um, by the way, this is a really uh, this is an aspect of uh, complexity, and if this, they don't care. It's of no value to them. The thing I shared, for example, with the uh, APIs was feedback and lessons from trying to talk about APIs as semi permanent membrane. And people are like, what? What? You, you semi semi what 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 mem mem what what are you talking about? <laughs> but showing, uh oh, so so you do the controller here, and then this allows only permission of this to here. Okay, I get that. Then what has this got to do with membranes? Forget about the membranes. This is what I was talking about. And then uh, you you have a partnership and a conversation. So uh, one manager of mine um, said to me, I was particularly upset because I thought about this thing. I'd read it up and I'd even written a white paper and it got completely shut down. And she pulled me aside and she said, people don't care about how the sausage is made cook the sausage, give them the sausage, and they want to taste it and enjoy it. I was like, okay, so that's a lesson that I've taken. So in general, I don't lead with that. I will mention it at some point when it's been effective and there is success that people can look at because then they have a positive example to say, oh, so that was the complexity thing that Dawn was witching on about. But okay, great, but it's working for me, I'm good. But I, 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 I tend to say no. Applied, practical, then you can talk about whatever theory you want to talk about. I think it's a shared experience with, with all our guests that it's just really hard and that people just, they don't want to engage with it. The, the difficulty is that you, you almost have to reduce the problem into like already a specific incarnation or specific solution okay. for them to engage. And then the real lesson is, is lost because the real lesson is that it's a superimposition of multiple things that are interconnected. Yeah. I don't think, Christoph, that the, the lesson is lost if you do it only once. If you apply it in different circumstances, then people get interested and curious. Mm -hmm. It's like, how how are you able to do whatever? Mm -hmm. And then you explain, so, okay, yeah, stop talking. You're talking about the complexity thing again. Okay, fine, you're doing what you're doing. Just show me. And what it's not that they're not interested, but it took me years to build the mental model. I didn't come, you know, turn up one day and all of a sudden uh, I had the ability. It was trial and error, trial and error, feedback, trial and error, trying this, and eventually it's like, okay, I finally figured the pathway through to, to get to the intersection. I always think about this like a set, but instead of a three-ven set, 
It's a 16 band, three dimension, like three dimensional chess. And you're trying to figure out how to get from one end of the maze to the other as quickly as possible. It takes practice. Mm -hmm. And eventually you can look at it and say, okay, I've done that before. So I know exactly I have to turn here, here. It's like people who solve a Rubik's cube in seven seconds behind their back. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just ridiculous to me, but they practice enough. They have the, 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 the mental model of that thing and they can do it in seven seconds. You can mix it up however you want. They literally turn it around, look at it. I've seen people do it behind their backs. It's solved. It is, so it's that sort of um, mental development and that just takes time. Okay. So repetition, I think is important. And by having a name for it, and you keep reinforcing that, eventually people will get it. That's it for this episode. This episode of the Resilience Podcast was brought to you by Pronovix and Contextualize. You can learn more about our companies at pronovix.com and maturitymapping.com. Thank you for listening and until next week, be sure to mind the context.